This podcast is brought to you by WRFL, Radio Free Lexington. Find us online at wrfl.fm. Catch us on your FM radio while you're in Central Kentucky at 88.1 FM, all the way to the left. Thank you for listening, and please be sure to subscribe. Hello and welcome to Philosophy Bakes Bread, food for thought about life and leadership. Philosophy Bakes Bread is a production of the Society of Philosophers in America, a.k.a. Sophia. I'm Dr. Eric Thomas Weber. And I'm Dr. Anthony Cashew. A famous phrase says that philosophy bakes no bread, that it's not practical. But we in Sophia and on this show aim to correct that misperception. Philosophy Bakes Bread airs on WRFL Lexington 88.1 FM and is distributed as a podcast next. Listeners can find us online at philosophybakesbread.com, and we hope you'll reach out to us on Twitter at philosophybb, on Facebook at philosophybakesbread, or by email at philosophybakesbread at gmail.com. Last but not least, you can always leave us a short recorded message with a question or a comment or even some soft, fluffy, bountiful praise that Eric loves so, so much. He really likes yeah. the, the soft part, the bountiful part. And we'll be able to play it on the show. We often do. And you can reach us at 859-257-1849. That's 859-257-1849. On today's show, we're extremely fortunate to be joined by Dr. Jane Roland Martin. Welcome, Jane. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a delight. Excellent. We, we are thrilled. Dr. Martin is a professor emerita of philosophy at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. She has published many books on philosophy, education, and gender, and received a Guggenheim Award. Ooh, that's fancy. That's very yeah. nice. Yeah, well done. Uh, her most recent book is titled School Was Our Life, published in 2018 with Indiana University Press. And we'll be asking her a lot about this book today, and we're, we're really excited. That's right. So we're honored to be speaking with you today, Jane. My colleague, Dr. Beth Goldstein, in Educational Policy Studies and Evaluation here at the University of Kentucky, let me know how much she has admired your work and encouraged me to check out a number of your essays that were, for me, very exciting to read. In particular, one of the first ones I read was a, a, an essay you wrote back in 1991, or you delivered then, on the contradiction and the challenge of the educated woman. I had a million questions arise as I read it, and I loved it, and we might get a chance to ask you some of those today. But at the same time, you're an authority figure on the philosophy of education and, and again, released your recent book, School Was Our Life, Remembering Progressive Education. So we thought we would talk with you today about each of these topics, you know, the philosophy of education and about your recent book, perhaps one at a time in our next two segments. So does that sound okay with you still as a plan? That sounds wonderful. Excellent. Oh, great. Well... As you know, Jane, before we get to the fun stuff, we like to make sure that our listeners know that philosophy really comes from philosophers. It seems like a, an obvious statement, but philosophers are people, they're real people, and we think it's important for our listeners to get to know our guest and to understand that philosophy comes from who the guest is and who, who, our, who our speaker is. So we have the first segment of our show is called Know Thyself. Know Thyself. Know Thyself. So we want to know whether you know thyself. Right? How did you how did, how did you become the person you are today, Jane? Uh, starting oh. very early on, and kind of you know later we're going to ask you kind of you know how you got into the study of philosophy. We'll ask you about what philosophy is, but we really want to know who who is Jane Roland Martin. Well, if you're asking me how I got to where I am, you really should tell people how old I am. <laughs> we would never do such a thing. Which is probably older than most of the people you had on your program. Any, uh -huh. Anyway. This, I'm going to be 90 this year. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Okay. Happy birthday. Early happy birthday. Thank you. A little in advance, but not much. Not much. <laughs> so what do you want to know? Do you want to know? Well, this is what I wanted to say about philosophy, because I was looking at your website, and I think the two of you both talked about how you, well, it's, you were philosophers from a young age. You were asking all these questions. So I want to say here and now, I was not 
I think I came to philosophy rather late, and I don't ah. think I, was, I wasn't one of those children who asked philosophical questions from day one. Oh well, let's start there then. What were you? So, what were you interested so, in before? So, before? Before your philosophical awakening, we'll call it. Well, uh, I think that's the problem. I wasn't really interested in anything. I well, let me say. One important thing to know thyself, to know me, is that I grew up in New York City. Mm -hmm. You know, I was I was a city child, and that already makes me different than all of us who grew up in in the city. I mean, really, the city, not the suburbs in Manhattan. Uh, you so know, so you I did not. Manhattan. Yeah, okay. I do not fit to begin with that stereotype that we have of the uh, traditional American home of father, mother, Dick, Jane, dog, spot, yeah. white back backyard, white picket fence, car, none, none of the above, right? We had, <laughs> we had no backyard. We had an apartment, no picket fence. And it wasn't fa father goes to work and mother stays home because mother was a school teacher public school teacher, so she also went to work. So, mm. so from the beginning, I guess I didn't quite fit the stereotype. Then the next, I think, so that's important probably for no sure. Yeah. But perhaps most important of all, I think, is that I went to a progressive school called the Little Red Schoolhouse in New York City's Greenwich Village. Because I think that was really a formative influence on my life. And that's why I've written a book about progressive education. Right. Because I have the, all these interviews. I have interviews with 30 of my classmates. When the people were grown up, I got these interviews from them. And it was the same for all of us. This school was really formative. Well, can you tell huh. us about the school then? The Little Red Schoolhouse? Little Red Schoolhouse. What, what was so special about the school? How is it different? Well, should we talk about it now or, or later? Well, why, why don't we focus on, you know, the things formative of you, of, yeah. of and Jane Roland Martin. Okay. Right. Yeah, so yeah. Let, now I'll just say it was wonderful, okay? And I'll tell you more later about okay. it. So, but that was formative. And then I think what was also formative was that I left Little Red Schoolhouse and went to an extremely traditional college, as traditional as you could get, which was Radcliffe, n now defunct, but it was the girls' part of Harvard. Mm. So, and I, I don't remember why, but I felt it at the time. I can remember feeling that it was important that I sort of leave the progressive school atmosphere and find out what everyone else was living through, which I did with a vengeance, I should say. Ah. But as for philosophy, the interesting thing is it was my senior year, it was my last semester, and I, was, I can remember I was telling my parents what courses I was planning to take. And I don't remember what the courses were, but I, my father said to me, you mean you're graduating from college and you will never have taken a course in philosophy? Oh, I like oh wow. <laughs> my yeah, father. Yeah, me too. He, he, was, he was horrified. And, the, and I had never, never thought, I never dreamed of taking a course in philosophy. And the other thing is he had never suggested I do so until my last semester. <laughs> Well, I was so upset and ashamed. It's not that I usually did what my parents said, but this, right. time, I, but this time I did. I went and I took, it was the second half of the introductory philosophy course, which was history of philosophy. So we started with Descartes. But so I took the course and then I graduated. I liked the course, but it's nothing special. I did well in the course, but it didn't occur to me that you know, that I had an affinity for it, or it had an affinity for me. I should, <laughs> I that was that. That was that. That was the first time I've ever heard of a parent forcing or suggesting a child take a philosophy class. It makes me happy. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, well, I, I really like that because some of our listeners have told us about how they've enjoyed, you know, the show, but they never th thought of themselves as particularly interested in something like philosophy before. So, so you're an example of someone who's made a whole, you know, career in and philosophy. I, I, and I wasn't interested in it at all. But then right, I, at first. And even, but even after taking the course, I wasn't interested in it. <laughs> <laughs> so... 
for I worked in New York for a, a year, and I couldn't stand being in an office from nine to five and and the routine. And I was working for an advertising agency, actually one of those that Mad Men was uh, based on. Oh boy, B- BB, BBDNO. Yeah. Uh huh. Batten, Batten, Barton, Burstyn. I can't say it. Batten, Barton, <laughs> Burstyn, and Osborne. <laughs> market research. And I realized that I didn't want to spend my life doing market research on Electrolux vacuum cleaners, Dinty Moore beef stew, and Johnny Mops. You don't even know what Johnny Mops are, but I'll leave you to guess. (laughs) <laughs> you're, you're painting quite a picture though so so i said well you know there's nothing i can do i'll have to become a teacher that's what my mother is so i always said i wouldn't do it but i became a teacher interesting so there i was teaching in, in a public school in massachusetts i taught for three years altogether two in a private school one in the public school in winchester massachusetts And I was really dismayed by the curriculum, the school Uh curriculum, which was the town curriculum, which was probably the curriculum of the whole of Massachusetts. I don't really know. And this social studies, for example, I went to visit the school the day before I started there, and the principal showed me this list of concepts I was to teach my class. This is fifth grade, social uh-huh. studies, uh-huh. a list of concepts, the concept of mountain, the concept of the Boston Tea Party, and the concept of longitude, you know. So we got longitude, the Boston Tea Party, and mountain. <laughs> Yeah, okay. right. I mean, there were about 20 or 25 or 30 others. But okay. I thought, but this, is, this is insane, right? This is insane. There's no connection. What am I supposed to be doing? This is terrible. Then there was, <laughs> then there was arithmetic, which, and they, someone afterwards invented the term lockstep curriculum for a, a curriculum. This was true in the math curriculum, where you had to, in fifth grade, you learn X, in sixth grade, you learn Y, in seventh grade, C, and there's never, you could never go beyond. So you have kids, especially in math, with a wide range of ability. So one kid really can't even do subtraction, and another one could probably do calculus or something. And I was had to teach them long division. Wow. And, I, and I mustn't go into decimals because that's for the, I'm teaching fifth grade. That's for sixth grade. And the sixth wow. grade teacher is going to be very upset if those kids come in already knowing decimals. <laughs> what was she supposed to and do then? One, that's right. That's right. So that, and hey. then, well, I don't know if you want me to go on with the art. I'll just tell you about art and then I'll stop. But I'm art, sure this is great. Art, which I couldn't teach at all because I was like a moron, I felt, in art. <laughs> but I, I, told the, I told the specialist who came once a week that I couldn't do it. And she was very nice, very sympathetic. So she would do it. And she told the children, she gave each child a big piece of paper and I think pastels or something. And she would tell them a story. The one I remember went like this. It's October. Your father is in the backyard burning leaves. Draw a picture. And she said, there's two rules. You start in the middle of the page and you you fill up the whole page. That's the first rule. Second rule was you have to finish by the end of the period. Mm. Huh. So there's this one boy in the class who actually was very terrible at subtraction, but he was this fantastic artist. And I noticed he started in one corner of the page, not the middle. (laughs) And it took him the entire week. Every time he had a free moment, he was working on his picture. And they were fantastic artwork. Wow. So I thought, this curriculum is terrible. So I'm sitting home on weekends (laughs) and vacations all by my lonely self, trying to revise the entire school curriculum. I finally finally realized this is ridiculous. I can't do it. 
Well, it just so happened that a friend of mine had told me that if we get a master's degree, we will get more money uh-huh. for our pay. And if, in those days in Massachusetts, you didn't really need any credits. I, I, I had, didn't have any credits in education, but I st- still was teaching. So we both signed up at the Har- at Harvard School of Edu- Graduate School of Education for a master's degree. We went there summers, and then whatever any course that met after four p.m. in the in the fall right. and the spring. I was up to m- again. I'm up to my last course for my master's degree. <laughs> A very good friend says you really should take a course with Israel Scheffler uh-huh. because he, he is a fo- an analytic philosopher. An analytic philosophy, get this, he says analytic philosophy is the key to everything. Huh. No comment. Okay. <laughs> Maybe maybe that's your joke right there. Right. <laughs> maybe you don't maybe you don't need any other funny jokes. For our <laughs> listeners, that, that's a that's an inside philosophy joke there. <laughs> it's a kind of philosophy as if it were all the philosophy. Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> so I went to I went to Scheffler and his course because his courses were all in the daytime when I couldn't take them. But he was giving an independent study to three people late in the afternoon and I joined that. And he assigned each of us I don't know how he did this. He says, Mrs. Perry, you will read Plato's Republic. Harriet Sachs, you will read Descartes' Meditations. Uh Jane Rowland, this is before I was married. Jane Rowland, this is it. You will read book six of John Stuart Mill's Logic. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) All right. And that's like the first thing I read, not counting my Phil philosophy 1B a million years ago. That's what I read <laughs> in this in this course. How did he pick? And, how did he pick book six? Uh, Mill's written an awful lot, and he did, he went straight for the. Okay, I don't know why. I have no idea why. <laughs> Absolutely no idea why, but although it was in his logic, it was it was about the social sciences, right. I think, and but I, I, so I don't know why. So 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 anyway, Jane, did, is that what that is that what hooked you in philosophy? Yeah, yeah, fantastic. So I went back to teach the, the year out, and I told the principal I've got to leave. I've go, got to go back to graduate school, and I did. That oh, is wonderful. Wow. So, well, so way, I got a lot of questions. <laughs> Do you okay, want to we're, we're, running, we're running out of time, but we, maybe we got one short question we can ask, and then we have to ask you an important question that we ask at the be- in, in, you know, in well, every I, first I, I, segment. I got the two together. The, the, the main okay, question we have to ask, Jane, and we ask oh, every one of our listeners, is is what is philosophy? And I, I guess I was going to tie it into you, what was it about Mill's, the sixth book of Mill's <laughs> Logic that, that kind of caught you and you're like, this is philosophy that I have to do. So, I mean, it, I don't know, maybe the two are, are separate entities. Maybe now that you've done a lot more philosophy, you're like, no, maybe it's not. But, but what is philosophy? We'll just, we'll just go there. Well, it's very, that's a philosophical question. What is philosophy? And it's different <laughs> things to different people. But right. I, and some people think it's all, all the theories that all the famous philosophers develop. But I tend to think of it as uh, it's about asking questions. Mm-hmm. And I think it's about asking questions that most people don't ask hmm. because they're very, very hard to answer. Like, what is truth? What is justice? And it's, but also, people don't like you to ask, often, a lot of people don't like you to ask them. And if you do ask them, they get very nervous and they tend to drop the subject. Hmm. And I just want to remind you that the first, supposedly the one of the first people who was asking these kinds of questions was Socrates. And we all know what happened to him because he was asking all these (laughs) questions. He was told to drink the hemlock. He was put in prison. And the hemlock. I think the hemlock was the ancient Greek equivalent of the electric chair or something. That's right. You know? That's right. So I say to you and the listeners, by all means do philosophy, but be careful. (laughs) (laughs) 
That is exactly right. And that's an excellent place to say that we're very glad to have three more segments coming with Dr. Jane Roland Martin. This is Eric Weber. My co-host is Anthony Cascio. And you all have been listening to Philosophy Bakes Bread. We'll be right back. This is Eric Weber with my colleague, Dr. Jane Jensen. Hi, Jane. Hi, everybody. Our colleague, Dr. Beth Goldstein, inspired today's episode. Thank you, Beth. This seemed like a great time to tell you all about the Department of Educational Policy Studies and Evaluation, EPE for short, in the College of Education at the University of Kentucky. Dr. Jensen is our Director of Graduate Studies. What does EPE offer, Jane? First, we have a master's program in ed policy. We have a master's in higher education with emphasis in student affairs or policy and administration in higher ed, as well as research methods in education. We also have graduate certificates in research methods and an international higher education certificate. Fantastic. And in addition to that, we have doctoral programs. Yes, we have an EDD in ed policy and evaluation and PhD programs in higher education and in educational sciences with tracks for evaluation and policy and for philosophy and cultural inquiry. Well, I think that's awesome, Jane, but why should our listeners come join us in one of our programs here? Well, obviously we have a lot to offer, but we're also very flexible. Students are encouraged to design their own pathways through our many programs. We're also interdisciplinary. Our faculty represent philosophy, sociology, anthropology, history, policy studies, with expertise in quantitative and qualitative methods as well as evaluation. We encourage our students to be interdisciplinary, too. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jane. Folks, to learn more, visit education.uky.edu slash EPE or email us at EPE at UKY.edu. Thanks so much for the info, Jane. Anytime. Welcome back, everyone, to Philosophy Bakes Bread. This is Anthony Cascio and Eric Weber here talking today with Jane Roland Martin. We're going to call this episode School Was Our Life, which also happens to be the title of Jane's recent book. In this segment, we're going to first talk about Jane's work in philosophy of education. In the last segment, we kind of heard a rather, I found it exciting story of how Jane got went from education into philosophy. And so we're going to get to talk a lot about how those two things inform each other. And then in the next segment, we'll have a chance to ask Jane about her new book, which I'm really really excited to talk about as well. So Jane, what we thought might be a first sort of obvious big picture question, which you noted in the last segment can also be a really difficult one. And one people want to kill you for asking, (laughs) but it's a big picture question. That's right. You know, what is the philosophy of education? An- another big philosophical question, right? Yep. And people people disagree a, lo- a lot. There's a standard, I think the standard way of talking about it has been to distinguish between this a- analytic philosophy of education, which is what I was learning when I went back to graduate school at Harvard, be- a distinction between analytic philosophy of education and normative. Now, normative philosophy of education meaning talking about what should be the case, what schools ought to do, what 17-year-olds ought to know, Mm -hmm. what a good, you know, what a good citizen is, or what good citizenship, rather, what good citizenship education is. Mm -hmm. In other words, all questions, that's normative philosophy of education. And analytic philosophy of education was, get this, and this is crucial to what what actually, uh, I didn't have a chance before to say what happened to me in graduate school. Well, let's hear about that too as you answer. This is going to uh, allow me to say what happened. Because analytic philosophy of education is not really about education. It is about talk about education. (laughs) So it's what what the word education means, right? What the concept or word teaching means. So it's the analysis of concepts and the analysis of arguments. Has this philo- has this person who said what we should do in school, have they given a logically sound argument? Have they justified their claims and so on? Mm-hmm. 
Now, and to, to top it off, some analytic, and if, if you go and look at history, I mean, the, the greatest philosophers of all had philosophies of education, Plato, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, John Dewey, all had were very important philosophers of education. Mm -hmm. They did normative philosophy of education. They talked about what education should be, mm -hmm. what children and, uh, and grown-ups too maybe should learn and so on. But comes analytic philosophy of education uh, just at the moment when I was went back to graduate school because Israel Scheffler was one of the leaders of that movement. And that was in the middle or middle to late 1950s. I, I got my PhD in 1961. A lot of those people are saying normative philosophy of education isn't philosophy of education. Huh. The only true philosophy of education is the analysis of concepts and so on, is the analytic type. And which means they're saying that philosophy of education is moving further and further away from real, real world problems. And this is what happened to me when I went to graduate school. What I wanted to tell you was when I went to grad, back to graduate school and studied philosophy, the good news was that I completely fell in love with the subject, and I had never really had any intellectual interest or, or other interests because I played the piano. I'd always studied piano, but I was never wildly enthusiastic about that or anything until I found philosophy. Hmm. So it was wonderful. I found philosophy. Philosophy found me. We fit each other perfectly. It was love forever. Fantastic. But. The bad news, <laughs> that's the good news, is the longer I studied philosophy, the further away I got from the classroom and real live educational issues. Mm. And before I knew it, I was fascinated by things like the structure of historical explanation. That's what I wrote my PhD thesis on. You know, it's very, very interesting and very controversial. And when you say, well, but what has that got to do with education? That is my question. Very, and this has to do with does philosophy break bake bread? Very little. <laughs> All and right. <laughs> so what philosophy and and that that's part of the problem. But another part of the problem, what was going on at, at that moment, a very important historical moment in the history of educational thought, is there was a man in England, R. Richard Peters, R. S. Peters, who actually came to Harvard when when I was there as a graduate student, and he then went back to England and he. He became sort of the leader in uh, in the English speaking world, mm -hmm. England, um, the British Isles, U.S., Canada, every the whole of the former British Empire, and so on. And he analyzed the the concept of education. This is doing analytic philosophy, and he analyzed it down so that it was like a mere shadow of its real self, if I can say that. Because in fact, and this is what I've devoted my most a lot of my work to, but one is the this, this study of w the place of women in educational thought. But that has led me into this whole issue of what is education, and it's so much broader than people think, and so much broader than Peter said, and that was sort of the way that everyone then and even now was thinking about education. So you've, right. you, you kind of yeah. saw your work kind of beginning to be a sort of response to this over-analysis of education and a move away from the classroom, a move away from the sort of the practical yeah. application. Okay, awesome. And I, th and I think it has to do with my having been at the Little Red Schoolhouse which was a Dewey, a John Dewey inspired school where, and John Dewey is the one who said, there's no sharp distinction between thought and action. Their school should be for the whole person and school is, and school is very connected to life. And what 
what was happening in the philosophy of education when I entered the field was really removing <laughs> removing education from life, from culture, from life, and just thinking about these words. So people people were defining, this is Peters mainly, defining education, first of all, as something that's intentional and voluntary right. hmm. and witting, oh. right? And that mainly goes on in school. And I'm thinking, no, no, you know, it's going on all over the place all the time from day one of your life till the very last day of your life. A great deal of a person's education is totally unintended and Uh involuntary. You don't know. I mean, if you start thinking about the media and what today children are learning, for better or worse, often for worse, a great deal of that is maybe not intended, certainly involuntary. It's not that the children or their parents are trying to learn that. You know, it's not like you're trying to learn the multiplication tables or something. You're just learning it through all these institutions of society. Mm. All, all of that, the huge spread of education was get it was lost to sight. And what I'm af- really afraid of, because, and I'm now writing a, a new book about the in- education and the environment, is it's still lost to sight. And people are still thinking of education only in terms of school learning and only in terms of what the teacher intends the children to learn. So I, when you I, have educational uh. research, people will say, well, okay, what does the teacher want these kids to learn? And then they look to see if the kids have learned it. Yes, right. you, you got your, your, your what, yearly test. Yeah, right? Have you met the standards? The uh, Do you know about mountains and <laughs> right. longitude? And longitude. Yeah. You, and, you, and you're not, you're not finding, but you, when you're doing that, you're not finding out, like, for example, what used to be called in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, the hidden curriculum of schooling. Right. What else are the kids learning while they're learning the definition of mountain? Right. right. While they're learning to memorize these things and getting bored stiff in school, what other things might they be learning, for example, to hate school and to, and to, be disenchanted with higher education and all the rest. Right. And uh, what are they learning when they're listening to talk radio and hearing about how people unlike themselves are being compared to rodents and insects and things? Wow. Well, this is all part of a person's education. Yes. Yeah. And the thing is this, Plato knew it. Plato was saying this in what, the 4th century B.C. Rousseau was saying it in the 18th century A.D. John Stuart Dewey was saying it. (laughs) I'm saying it. But people are paying no attention. That's amazing. That's right. That's a big problem, though. I mean, it seems like a really important point, but then you got almost a, a, well, an advertising problem. (laughs) Jane, Jane, I think you've made a really rich distinction here. Uh, and, th- and and it seems to me that it, it, that it is really problematically carried forward today in just what Anthony uh, was, was pointing out, this kind of accountability culture we've got today, where we want to make sure our schools are doing X, so you make sure the teacher's doing Y, and that the students, you know, pres- produce result Z, as if that's all that's going on in education, and we've got this incredible narrowing. And this devaluation of, you know, the, the child in education, like, you know, what's, what's, the, what's the, the pupil's role? And, and, and an outgrowth of that has to do with the fact that you, you touched on this, grown-ups maybe too. Well, when I, when I open the newspaper, I'm getting some amounts of education too, aren't I? And, and, and as you say, you know, being conditioned, like when you, th- you see your child learn something that, that you're not thrilled that they learn, where did you learn that? You know, we ask, right? They, you know, there's education going on, as you say, unintentionally that should trouble us Con- constantly constantly that's a really important point right and it, th- this this example comes from the, the, the book i'm now writing which is uh, has to do with the environment but uh, this is a couple of years ago there was a very interesting article in the paper it was in the new york times this was a high school in ohio i think it was it mm-hmm. was a science class and the science teacher was sh- had just shown a video on climate change mm-hmm. 
And this high school girl gets very upset and she runs out of the classroom. So he gets on the microphone. He says, I have a runner. I had never actually heard this expression before. I read it it's in the newspaper. Has a runner. So then he asks, he says to the class, you know, why is she leaving? What do your, and finally, they have sort of have to explain to him. He says, what do your parents think of our talking about climate change? And they say, well, the, you know, they think you're just telling us a bunch of lies. See, so mm. what the teacher needs to know and doesn't seem to realize that this girl, these students, it was the majority of his class, have been learning all about cli climate change, yes. namely yep. that it's a myth, not in school, not even maybe intentionally or wittingly, but from their parents, from the, from the, from the media that they are have exposed to, probably in their neighborhood and church, all sorts of places, that it's, you know, that it's a myth, and they've come to learn to distrust science. Well, if he's going to teach them successfully, he needs to know that. But on the way people are thinking about education, that's irrelevant, and they don't think about that. That's incredibly important. Yes. And we've got a number of additional questions we desperately want to ask you. But fortunately, we have two more segments with Jane Roland Martin. This is Eric Weber. My co-host is Anthony Cascio. And we're going to come back and maybe start off with some of these questions that are burning in our minds that we want to ask you, Jane. Thanks, everybody, for listening to Philosophy Bakes Bread. We'll be right back. If you're hearing this, that means podcast advertising works. WRFL is now accepting new applications for advertising in a selection of our original podcast series. If you or someone you know owns a business in Central Kentucky and would be interested in advertising on WRFL's original podcast, please email development at wrfl.fm. Welcome back, everyone, to Philosophy Bakes Bread. This is Anthony Cashew and Eric Weber, and today we're having just an absolutely uh, just delightful conversation with Jane Roland Martin about school was our life. And the last segment was, uh, well, it was educative. We talked about education and how education is a lot more than what just takes place in the classroom. And I, for myself, the conversation we just had, I think, is a good example of learning quite a bit about education and the history of education. So we're going to continue that conversation in this segment, and then we'll have a chance to ask, ask Jane about, to tell us about her new book, School Was Our Life. I think Eric was chomping at the bits uh, at the end of the last segment to, to ask you a question. So Eric, go for it. So, so, so I, I, I do. I, I, I want to focus in this segment on your new book, Jane, and we might do a breadcrumb episode about some of the questions that were burning in our minds after that last segment. Uh, but so, why don't we talk? Why don't we begin then talking about your new book? Just big picture, sort of softball question. You know, what led you to write the new book? School was our life, and what's it all about? Oh, well, I, the, <laughs> it's amazing what led me to write this book is just amazing. So I graduated from the Little Red School House in Greenwich Village from the eighth grade in 1943. Okay. We were, if, you can yeah. believe, if you can believe such a thing. And <laughs> so we, we, we graduated from the eighth grade. That was that. You know, we went off in our separate ways. The school had just instituted a high school, and so I went to the high school, and some of us did, but half or more of us went to other schools in, in New York. So time passes. I mean, decades pass, and I think it was sometime in the, maybe in the late 80s, one day I get a, le a letter from Henry, Henry Rose, in my in my elementary school class, and he is writing to people. He wants to hear from people, what are we doing now? And if we write to him, he'll circulate the letters. So some of us wrote to him. He circulates the letters, and he says, let's have a reunion at my house. And he now lives in Worcester, Massachusetts. Mind you, the school's in New York. Mm 
So he has the reunion and about 10 or 11 of us and our spouses up here. Hmm. And it was this incredible time. So my friend Heather comes with all these pictures, these photos of her children and her travels and her dog and everything. She never gets these out of her purse because we sit on the lawn, Henry's house, This house does have a a lawn and a picket fence, I suppose. (laughs) And we we sing the songs that we sang in school, and we recite the poems that Mr. Marvin read to us, and we remember everything that happened, it seemed. And if someone doesn't remember the other star, and it was just incredible. So then we go home, and then there's they arrange to have a reunion in New York, and I go to that. And then the next year I say, you know, this is enough. I can't keep going to New York every year for these reunions. But my friend Heather tells me that one one of us has died. Natalie has died. And I suddenly realize I've got to go because and I begin, it had to do with the book I was then writing. And that book is called Cultural Miseducation. Mm-hmm. And I, I think it was published in 2002, but I was already thinking about this. And I was thinking about the, what I call the cultural wealth, the wealth of cultures. And I thought, we, our memories really are sort of the repositories of all this cultural wealth about progressive education. We are starting to die off, our generation. When we die, no one's going to know about progressive education. At least they won't know about it from the standpoint of the children. We're the products of this amazing experiment in American education that took place in the first half of the 20th century. And supposedly the high point of it was just before World War II and maybe during World War II, and then it's sort of uh, lessened. And that's when we were in school. That's when we were, we call it Little Red. That's when we were at Little Red. Mm -hmm. So, So I went to the reunion that year, and when I came back, I got in touch with Patricia Graham, who's a historian of education. Yeah, And I, I said, I really need a second opinion. I think we should do an oral history. Do you, th- you think it's important enough? And she said, yes, you can do an oral history, but you're a philosopher, so you're not qualified to interview anybody. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> she says to the interviewer. But, but if I found some good interviewer, then I should apply to the Spencer Foundation for a small grant. And she was the head of that. So I got an, an anthropologist. She was a new PhD in anthropology who had been one of my students at UMass Boston, where I taught. And she had done a thesis in which she interviewed people. So we put in for a small grant. And we got it. And she interviewed she interviewed about 15 of my classmates and then the money ran out and she couldn't continue. So then a a high school classmate of mine interviewed 15 more and I ended up with 30 interviews of my, of my classmates. That's fantastic. How big was your class? Well, see this school had was started. the, The founder of the school was named Elizabeth Irwin and she was a psychologist. She lived in New York, obviously, in the in the village. And she started this as an experiment in the New York public school system. But come the Depression, they ran out of money. They, the city stopped funding it. And the parents met of these kids in these special classes in, the, in PS 43, 41, mm-hmm. I'm sorry. The parents met in an ice cream parlor in Greenwich Village, and one man, they thought they were just saying goodbye. One man got up. He said he was he was a butcher. He said, I will give $5 a week if this school stays open as a regular school for, for my daughter to go. And someone else got up and said, I will give $2 a week. And other people got up, and that's how the school Found it was founded as a, a separate school, oh, and that was 1932. Awesome. Yeah, that was 1932. So I didn't go there till fifth grade. Now they they didn't call it by grades; they called it, but they kept us in our age group. So this was the tens. 
we were all either, you know, nine going on 10 or 10 already. And they didn't believe in holding anyone back. They didn't believe in putting you forward unless you were just terribly, terribly mature uh, for your age. They didn't believe in, uh, well, (laughs) I mean, we didn't get grades. Right. They had written reports, I guess, but no grades. You know, we had we had things like arithmetic tests and spelling tests, right. but we didn't. Ha- we had almost no. We had no real exams other than that, and we did these incredible things there. That's that's how. Oh, and how, why did I why did I write this book? Right. Because I wrote. I sent a letter to my classmates telling them they would be interviewed, and I made the crazy promise. I said, "And I will write a book." <laughs> and then for years, I didn't write the book because I always had some other book to write. And finally, when I finished my last book before this, when which was published, it's called Education Reconfigured. It was published, I think, in 2011. And then I thought, okay, I've got to do it. I mean, we'll all be dead if I don't do this now. <laughs> And so it just it just came out. Right. So and so the book is a collection of the interviews and then your reflections no, upon no. them. It's oh so what I say, which this is really important. No, it's written. It's by me. I use the interviews, but what I it's really written from the dual standpoint of the child I was when I graduated from eighth grade in May 1943, and the philosopher of education I became when I got my PhD from Harvard in 19, June 1961. So it's all me, but it's backed up with these interviews. And what I when I did the interviews, we didn't know what people, I really didn't know what my classmates would think. I mean, when we had our reunions, they were just gung-ho, but I didn't know what they would say. And these these things, you know, ab- absolutely incredible what, what they say about, I loved school. Hmm. Uh, one, they say school was my life. I hear I have a couple of things. Sure. One one man says I never understand understood the common mythology that kids hate school. I don't think we hated school. We love school. And another one says what we were ashamed of is if we were late to school too often and then we were sent home. This was a bad punishment that we couldn't come to school that day. Right. Punish, punishment See? is is not school, huh? Yeah, right. It's like the opposite of what we're used to today, right? Right. So, so Jane, you know, yeah. in our earlier in our episode, you made a distinction between traditional education and progressive education, and I suspect that most of our listeners don't know much about the difference. You've alluded to it a number of times, but you know, if we were to ask you for for just sort of general listeners in Central Kentucky or whomever listens to the podcast wherever they are in the world, what what really is the main distinction between you know, progressive education and traditional education, at least that was at work in the times that you're talking about this school? Well, first of all, I must say that there's lots of different types of progressive education. Right. And my school was quite unlike a lot. Of, there were other schools like mine, but some were very different. So you may have heard of Summerhill in England. Mm-hmm. A.F. Neal was the head of that. I, I don't know if it still exists, but it was it, it, it was there forever. Total freedom. And this, I think, is a caricature. I mean, it's true. It was true of Summerhill, where the, the, the kids could do whatever they liked and they could study or not study whatever they wanted. It was a boarding school, I think. My school was nothing like that. Mm-hmm. Then there was the Dalton School in New York, and they, with the Dalton plan was kind of independent study where they couldn't do whatever they wanted. They had to st- do the math or the reading or the history or whatever it was. But they d- they signed a contract with their teacher. Each child individually worked at, her, it was all girls after the lower grades. They worked at their own pace, more or less, and, and had this contract thing. Little Red was not like that at all. So Little Red First, one and another thing that really distinguished Little Red was that the, the Miss Irwin and the teachers thought of the school because it had started as an experiment within the public schools. Mm-hmm. So they thought of it as a model 
for the public school, New York City public school system. And therefore, the classes, our classes were very big. I mean, we tended to have about 35 kids in our class. This is not the way you think of private independent schools, but we had large classes and the tuition, there was tuition. It was very low compared to other private schools. And if you couldn't afford it, then you didn't pay. You had a scholarship and there was nothing like exams to go to this school. Anyone who applied, as long as there was room in the class, went, and then you were kept in your, with your age group. I think a key to this school which is very different from most public schools, most traditional schools. And this was Miss Irwin's idea. She wrote a book in the 1920s called Fitting the School to the Child. Mm. She said, traditionally, everyone thinks that the child is, you're supposed to fit the child to the school. Right. Right. And this, is, this is why, you know, and so children fail, they're held back. And they also are bored to death and they have become disciplinary problems. She said that people have it backwards. It's, instead of fitting the child to the school, Little Red Schoolhouse is going to, we're going to fit the school to the children. And so one of the things that fit, fit <laughs> the school to the children was that they didn't teach reading in a formal instruction sense until second grade, till seven, till the seven, well, you were seven years old, because they didn't think children were physically ready. Hmm. And if you didn't, couldn't read then, if you weren't learning, that was perfectly all right. Your parents might get a little nervous, but Miss Irwin said that's perfectly all right. And some kids didn't learn to read till they were eight or nine or ten. Wow. And then all of a sudden they learned. Huh? Right, right. So that was one of the principles. And then this is a very John Deweyan bit of philosophy. School is this is this is from Dewey. School is not he said school is not preparation for life. School is life. I think that's wonderful. Well, I actually would think he should have said school is preparation for life and is but it's also right and they believed that school and this is why you know the name of the book school was our life because we lived our lives in school then i found this wonderful letter in in a parent in a bulletin that they sent around to parents this man had written not a letter i guess it was an article comparing when he had been a kid in a New York traditional public school and his own son in Little Red. He says when he went to school, his life began when he got home in the afternoon. Hmm. When his son comes home in the afternoon, he's already led, had his life and he's sort of winding down. Wow. That's good. He's not starting life at three or in the afternoon or something. He's had his life all day in school. And he said, that's the way it should be. His kid is so happy. And he hated school. That's, is, a, beautiful is it, little note. Yeah. that's a wonderful illustration. I, I, am, I am sad to say that we're out of time for this segment. We're very happy that we have time for one more. This is Eric Weber. My co-host is Anthony Cascio. And we've been just sitting on the edge of our chairs listening to Dr. Jane Roland Martin talk about her recent book, School Was Our Life. We'll be right back after a short break. Welcome back to Philosophy Bakes Bread. This is Anthony Cascio and Eric Weber. Today we've been having a delightful, enthralling, and uh, educative conversation with Jane Roland Martin about school was our life. We've been talking about progressive education, education in general, philosophy of education. We've been educating ourselves about education. It's, <laughs> it's, been, it's been really fun. In this last segment, we're going to end with a big picture question or two for Jane. We'll ask about philosophy baking bread. We might even tell a joke or two. They might even be good. I don't know. We'll see. And then we'll end with a question for you, our listeners, to think about as we go about our daily business. Jane, you've mentioned kind of how the sort of uh, the heyday of progressive education was kind of kind of hit its climax in the 40s. You know, you get you've given an example of several schools, including your own, the, the Little Red Schoolhouse. 
and it's kind of it's fallen by the wayside. And we've got you mentioned you mentioned like Rousseau and John Dewey and even Plato, and you talked about these kind of different ideas about progressive education, and yet people aren't listening. I think that's what you said. People aren't listening. Do you have any ideas on how to get how do you how do you sell this? How do you get more people to listen and 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 convince them that this is something worth taking seriously? Well, I suppose the answer is is more radio shows like yours. <laughs> hey, I'll take that. <laughs> it's essential. That's that's what I say. Yeah. I mean, there are when I say this that, that no, first of all, the Little Red Schoolhouse still exists. It's in Greenwich Village. It has a different it has a different address because they moved the door from Bleecker Street onto Sixth Avenue around the corner, and I was there. I had a, they we had a book launching there. So this these schools exist, but I think they're a very sort of minor minor stream, not the the main stream. There are some practices, no doubt, that the, the some practices that John Dewey and the others advocated have taken hold. The, the chairs and the desks used to be nailed to the floor. They probably aren't anymore. You mean in, in traditional public <laughs> yeah. schools? In traditional public schools, right. right. They're not. Okay. okay. But the, 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 kind of things we did and the activities we have, which I didn't begin to talk about, which we're putting on place. I mean, when I was 10 years old, the best thing, it's one of the best things that still at age nine has ever happened to me was that I was in the group of children. There were six of us who carried this mummy named Johnny Murphy. He was Johnny Murphy. We were studying the ancient Egyptians, and our job was to demonstrate to the whole school how you wrap up a mummy. He carried him onto the stage. We wrapped him up, we, <laughs> and then we picked him up, and we carried him out. And to this day, I'm still in awe that I did that. <laughs> okay. That's, that's pretty awesome. And, and you still remember it, right? So that's a great example. I remember it. Oh, my God, of course, yeah. and I remember that with Johnny. I remember everything, but what? So <laughs> where were we? I think just it was just a, a very recently in the last week or so, there was an op-ed column in the New York Times about what how children should. It, it's really good for children to be bored. Yes, I, th I saw that. That was the. Yeah. Did, did I you saw see that, that? And I read parts of it to my my kids who were saying they were bored. Wow! And I was like, yeah, good right. for you. Okay, so this this journalist who seems to be um, an important important one on the Times wrote this article of how by how boredom is really a very good thing, and the, the one of the main reasons it, it, the children should appreciate it is because school is boring. She says, she says, school school is often boring, so it's really good. And anyway, boredom is good because when you're bored, you think all sorts of creative thoughts. And I have a friend, she says, who wrote a novel because she was so bored. <laughs> and then people wrote in letters telling about, yes, boredom is wonderful, and I wrote this, and I did this. Well, I mean, let's face it, boredom is also what, what turns children away off of school mm -hmm. that turns them into delinquents that makes them unable yeah. to learn and makes them fail right. right nobody's talking about that but she is and she's saying teacher and then she says well they have to be bored in school because the teacher's job is not to entertain the teacher's job is to teach and she's doing exactly what John Dewey told schools not to do. She's making a sharp distinction between work and play, mm. right? Learning is your work. Children, your – and my son was in a – supposedly a wonderful school in Massachusetts. Uh, he came home from the sixth grade, and the – the principal had come in and told them that some of them were chewing gum, and that's very bad because school is your workplace. See, so this notion that school, this is traditional schooling is thought to be your workplace. It's not fun. It's dr often drudgery. And you've got to put up with it and realize that that's what it is. No, no. Work does not have to be drudgery. Like this goes all the way back. This goes way beyond yeah, John Dewey. This back is, this to is at least lesson that, so. yep. 
Well, this is a lesson that, that goes right. beyond the We're classroom just... too, right? You know, we, we complain about we go into work yeah, or it's right. going to be this drudgery. Yeah. And of course it's not fun. It's work, but it, it you know. Yeah, right. But I mean, it depends. Some work is yep. obviously, but school does not, factory work and so on, but school does not have to be that kind of work. And this is what Rousseau said in his most important book about education is called Emil. And it's about this, sort of about this boy, Emil, who he's educating in this perfect way. And he says, Emil just can't distinguish between work and play. His play is his work, his work is his play. And that was true of progressive education that we had, at least. We had, we didn't make it that kind of distinction, you know. That's wonderful. We, so, so- we put out a magazine. We put out a magazine. So we're learning to write. We're learning to spell, hopefully. We're learning grammar. We're learning all these things. and But we're working. And we had a printing press, and we had to learn to set type. Oh, wow. We did the, because we're studying the Middle Ages. Wow. So we're setting type, and we learn all about, uh, what's his name, the Wittenberg Bible, uh, Gutenberg Bible and everything. And then we're setting the type, and then we're doing a magazine. So that's work, and that's play all together. That sounds like that's, an ideal. That's fantastic, yeah. We didn't have time to be bored. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So one question, Jane, you know, one final big picture question for this moment is just to ask you, you know, it, it, if we're not going to have a whole bunch of progressive schools everywhere, which maybe we should, you know, is there a way we could yeah. incorporate more of the insights of progressive education in our traditional schools that we have now? How could we, what insights could we bring from progressive education into our, you know, the more traditional classrooms that we've got all around the country? This is a, a very hard question. I in my in my book, I I try to say some some of the le- some of the lessons. I think actually I didn't say anything about this, and this I think is just crucial. And I should think this could be incorporated. It has to be, and that is that Miss Irwin. Go, this is again John Dewey believed, first of all, that democracy is a way of life. Democracy is not just a business of voting for one candidate or another. Democracy is a way of life, and it has to be learned, and you need to start learning as soon as you can. And we started learning this in in kindergarten, when we're, and it was just learned by when the kids are doing things with paints or whatever they're doing, then you have to cooperate in cleaning up the room. That's one thing. Second thing is that when these, when my, in the interviews, we found out that people said they never heard words that I probably shouldn't even be saying on this microphone. So I guess I, <laughs> I, I don't know what I can say. We can bleep them. We the can mic. bleep things. <laughs> you can, okay. They never heard the word <laughs> until they left and went to other schools. Wow. If we wouldn't, if we, anyone at, we didn't dream of saying these kinds of things about people because this was part of the school's hidden oh, curriculum, wow. the hidden schooling was that everybody's equal you respect everybody they're different from you they're the same and they tried to have diversity in the classroom so they had a specifically interracial policy where anyone and this was in a day in the days when you know it was because housing was uh, segregated, so was so were schools. Uh, we, we this was an interracial policy. Interclass, we had poor and rich. Nobody knew which was which. Interreligion, we had Protestants, Catholics, and Jews. Everything of the times. Now schools today have many more of these than we ever dreamed of, and because of immigration right. today. But then the school has to work at that. That's part of. Our school took that to be part of schooling. And what I say in my book is that they taught us to expand our de- the definition of we, W-E, we, to include all people. Wonderful. I love that. The, I really I love that. I don't see yeah. why schools that, that, That's, that's that. beautiful. So one of our final questions, Jane, comes from the inspiration for our show. Would you say that philosophy bakes no bread, as the famous saying goes, 
or that it does. How and why? Explain. Show your work. Pop quiz. You ready? <laughs> <laughs> of course, my you, you could probably guess what my my first comment is going to be. You know, well, I pointed first. What's the what's the bread? What kind of bread well, are you nice talking gelata. about? <laughs> and brioche. And how how nourishing is the bread? And but I think it's not really so. The question maybe I have to change the question sure. is not just baking the bread. But who's buying it and who's eating it? Is anyone you? It's one thing for philosophy to bake bread. It's another f- thing for anyone to eat uh-huh. the bread. Uh-huh. Oh boy, that's great. We haven't never gotten that answer. No, we've okay. never gotten an answer like that, Jane. That was great. Fantastic. So some some of some of my colleagues now. Philo- you think that philosophy of education? You would think, okay, logic, metaphysics. They don't bake any bread. They're not practical. If there's anything practical, it's got to be philosophy of education because it's about education. That's practical. No, some of my colleagues, very reputable colleagues, say that philosophy of education really does should not have anything to say to every day. You know, to school. Oh, that breaks my heart. Well, I don't. I, I have a hard time making any sense of that. I don't know. Is it? Is it going back to the analytic school of uh, philosophy education? Yes, 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 okay. yes. Of course. Yes, of course. Which, of course, I started to depart from when I uh, when I took up my study of women, which we haven't oh talked about at all. But stay that's, tuned, listeners. That's we'll have something on that. Yeah, we hope to have a breadcrumb if we have time about that. Yeah. So I spent my career. I would say trying to get back. I told you that I got further and further away from the classroom with the study of philosophy. And I feel as if I spent all, not all the years, but it started with the Vietnam War and the student protests, when students were saying, this is so irrelevant. And they were saying it not just of philosophy, by the way, but of all academic studies. And I had sympathy with that. Most of my colleagues did not. But I had sympathy with that, and that's when I started thinking, okay, how do I get home again? How, how do I nice. start talking to real people about real problems? And, well, I think this book does. We know school was our life, and it's not just it's not a me- it's not a simple straightforward memoir or anything like that it's really about what schools ought, ought to be and that the point is that they can be this school was right that's wonderful yeah that, uh, no that's absolutely that's great all right. Well, Jane, you know, you pointed out earlier that, you know, this distinction between work and play is really a false distinction, right? And and and, and work yeah. and play yeah. and work are, can be the same thing. And uh, it's just like philosophy doesn't always have to be super serious. It can be fun. It can be lighthearted. And Eric and I take that kind of pretty seriously. So that's why we always kind of end with a nice little, we, you know, we bake the bread and then we got to have our donut too. So we have a little dessert at the end, which we call philosophunnies. Say philosophunnies. Philosophunnies. <laughs> Say philosophies. Philosophies. <laughs> so that that of course is Eric's son, young son. Uh, so we'd love to hear if you have a favorite joke or a funny fact or a funny story about education or 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 just you know philosophy in general or just really just frankly anything. Just if you have a good story for us. Okay. I'll tell, can I tell you a not so funny one, and then I'll tell you a, what I think is funny. I don't know if sure. you think sure. uh, which. Yeah. How do I start? Yeah, let's let's so start with the not so or, funny. We'll work our way up. We'll just kind of. So I was teaching. I spent a, a good portion of my life in the philosophy department at UMass Boston, which was wonderful. Philosophy is notorious for having very few majors, but we really attracted a lot of students. They were not necessarily majors, a lot of, st- but some, ma- a lot of majors also, because we sort of th- tried to invent courses that people would be interested in. So we introduced a course called Contemporary Moral and Social Problems as an introductory course that you could take instead of the standard intro right. course. And the moral pro- these problems, we, we took the sanctity of human life to be kind of a basic value. And so the problems were things like the death penalty, euthanasia, abortion, war, all really those, difficult all those fun problems. problems right? 
Otto Fun Province. And I would always start, we had like 25 to 35 students because we had small classes so there could be discussion. Always start by telling them the value of human life is taken to be of basic value. And one day, at the very first day, this young woman who I knew because she was a, a women's studies student of mine also, raises her hand when I say that, and she says, I don't really think that the life is, sanctity of life really is a basic human hmm. value. And then she starts talking about the, all the wars around the world, all all the famines, all, all, all the domestic violence against children and so on. And I'm standing there thinking, oh, my word, you know, she's yeah. right. Why have I been saying this all the time? We're all saying this. We're not thinking about what we're doing. That's pretty profound. So that's, that's, my, great. that's my funny my funny story, my funny yes. not No, so it funny is funny, story. actually. I mean, it's kind of amazing. We always talk about how the students teach us, and I think that's a great, great example. That's a rich example. Yeah. So here. So here's here, uh, here's one though. So I was writing this book. This this is sort of what made me see that I had to do this oral history with my with my classmates because I was writing a book about culture, the culture's wealth, and what we are and are not passing down to the next generation. And this this came out. This grew out of my study of women and how we're not passing down women's history and the deeds of women and so on. So I was talking to. My, my, this is a colleague in Oklahoma, Susan Laird. You may or may not know her. And, and I'm telling her all about my theory about the, all, the, all this cultural wealth that should be preserved. And she says, you know, you really are a child of the Depression. You remember that I was born in uh -huh. 1929, July, and the Depression started in right. October? 1929. She says, you really are a child of the Depression. She says, my grandmother has a box and the label on it is string too short to use. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wow. <that's> funny. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> string too short to use. Won't even get you. Like, oh boy. Yeah, that, that sounds about right. I, I've got family that, that still, they still save wrapping paper. Like at Christmas, because you got to reuse it. And it's, yeah. That's just it's that depression right. air mindset. You just, you I, just I have a relative who will not be named who would take out the shoulder pads from the outfits that she would buy. And instead of throwing them out, she had a box of the shoulder pads, which she was never going to use in anything. But she well, could. You never know. You oh, never know when not, you're going to need You never know. And you never know about the string too short. Yeah. To, 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 my, yeah. my, I've had to have a conversation with my mother recently. Like, Mom, we're not in the depression. You don't need to save every single yogurt container. You, you don't need any more. You have enough. You can put all your. All your pasta sauces together. I think we don't need any more jokes. I, I think that, that this is pretty good here. <laughs> All right. Well, that was that was that was fun. All right. So, uh, last little segment before we wrap everything up, we do like to take advantage of the fact that today we have powerful social media that allow for communications, two-way communication, even for programs like radio shows. So, we want to invite our listeners to send us their thoughts about big questions that we've raised on the show. And I, uh, you know, like a lot of our episodes, we raise some big, meaty questions, and all sorts of things to think about as we go on our day. That's right. Well, given that, Jane, we'd love to hear your thoughts about what question you think we should pose for our listeners for our future segments that we call You Tell Me. Have you got a question for our listeners? Well, I, I'll ask them this question because I'm writing a, a hard at work on a new book. And the, the, this is, I'm going to ask you the question that I'm asking myself. Okay. And my working title is the title of this book. I don't know whether it will end up being this is changing human nature. And this is a book about the uh -huh. environment, and the desperate state we're now in. So my question is this, do you think it, my question is two parts. Do you think that to preserve the natural environment of the planet, that the not we don't have to worry about preserving the planet. The planet is going to live on, but the natural environment that has allowed our species to flourish. Do you think that to preserve this, human nature has to change? 
And if you think so, then the question is, can we change it? Oh, Interesting. That is that is so good. Ooh, that's, I want to have you. I, I want to have you on to have a whole conversation about that right there. <laughs> that's, uh, that's that sounds like a really good question. That's right. All right. Well, I want to remind everyone to check out Jane's book. School is our life. We've been talking about it all episode, and it's it's just about progressive education. Check out the book. And thank you everyone for listening to this episode of Philosophy Bakes Bread. Your host, Anthony Cashew and Eric Weber are very grateful to have been joined today by Jane Roland Martin, and we hope you listeners will join us again. Consider sending us your thoughts about anything you've heard today that you'd like to hear about in the future or about the specific questions that we raised for you, especially this awesome one that Jane has just raised, right? Do you think that to preserve the sort of natural environment of the planet, does human nature need to change? And if so... (laughs) How? How do you? Is that start? possible, right? Yeah, is that even possible? That last one might be the hard part. Uh, that's that's a a question that's pretty motivating, or at least gets me wondering. Has my yeah. my ears perked up? Well, remember everyone, you can catch us on Twitter, Facebook, and on our website at philosophybakesbread dot com. And there you'll find transcripts for many of our episodes. And one more thing, folks, if you want to support the show and to be more involved in the work of the Society of Philosophers in America, the easiest thing to do is to go consider joining as a member by heading over to philosophersinamerica dot com. And if you are enjoying the show, and we hope you are, maybe take a quick second to rate and review us on wherever you're getting us today, Apple Podcast or Spotify. A, a good review helps us work with the algorithms, reach more people, bake more bread, do more philosophy, all the great, wonderful things that we are, are trying to do today. And of course, you can always email us at philosophybakesbread at gmail.com. And you can also call us and leave a short recorded message with a question or comment that may be able to play on the show at 859 859- 257-1849. One last time, I want to thank you, Jane, for joining us today. We've had an absolutely wonderful conversation. So thank thank you. you again for joining us. Thank you. All right. And we hope you listeners will also join us again next time on Philosophy Bakes Bread, food for thought about life and leadership. enjoying this podcast from WRFL Lexington, you may enjoy our live radio stream at WRFL.FM and, of course, via radio at 88.1 FM in the central Kentucky area. We have a wide variety of programs you're sure to enjoy. Just go to WRFL.FM slash schedule and see what programs appeal most to you. Thanks again for listening to this podcast from WRFL Lexington.